Hello, good evening. My name is John Tibbetts and I'm the assistant director here at the Atwood Museum and Chatham Historical Society. Before we get started with tonight's lecture, I'll just go over a few upcoming events that we'll be having. We'll be hosting an in-person speaker series at the Orpheum Theater in partnership with the JFK Museum in Hyannis. Each museum has selected a speaker who will each present an engaging lecture. Both talks will be prepared and presented from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. with free refreshments and a Q&A session to follow. The lectures will be free of charge. On September 22nd at 9.30, retired Naval, Naval Commander Don Broderick, archivist at the Atwood and chair of our lecture committee, will educate us on the Chatham Naval Air Station. On September 29th at 9.30, Michael Krasnack, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Bridgewater State University, will present a talk titled, From Bush to Biden, Nation Building, Democracy and Counterterrorism in the Middle East. More information will be on our website. On October 12th at five, we will host another Tuesday talk here on Zoom. Andrew Singer, who is a writer and speaker, will present a title called Sailing to Cathway, a talk about trading routes between China and the US. We are coming up onto the holiday season. I, I know it's already September, but it'll become here before you know it. There'll be a suite of holiday events, including Batwood, which will be a hybrid outdoor indoor event with lots of fun activities for the kids, including pumpkin decorating and trick or treating. Admission will be free. And stay tuned as we hope to gear up for more holiday events come into December. And now, Ian Ives is the director of the Mass Audubon um, Sanctuaries here on the Cape. His job responsibilities include overall management of the sanctuaries and staff, community outreach, advocacy, environmental stewardship, and education. One of his primary goals is to engage the community in Mass Audubon's mission work and expand activities of the wildlife sanctuaries he oversees. And so now, now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Awesome. I will share the screen. Thanks, John. And, uh, Great to not see you all. <laughs> um, we're getting used to these uh, online presentations. They do have a lot of benefits, that's for sure. Um, this one will be recorded, it looks like, like and uh, be able to be viewed again sometime down the line. So that's a good thing. But I do wish I was with you all in person, like we did in the old days, um, so that we could be a little more interactive and informal about this. But I'm going to go ahead and queue up this slideshow from the beginning. And I think the way John was gonna arrange it is we could um, take questions at the end. You can submit your questions on the chat and then we'll have a chance after about 30, 35 minutes of my presentation to, to talk uh, informally, answer questions you might have about this unique and little known subject of, of vernal pools. And I hope you learned something tonight. This is, a, this is a, a subject that is a little known. It's a little more esoteric than a lot of the other subjects you might um, be presented with. But this is something very near and dear to my heart and something that uh, Mass Audubon and many collaborator, collaborators have been working on for years. And that is Vernal Pool Ecology Education vernal pool restoration and endangered species management. And so this presentation talks a little bit about each of those three and gives you some real life case studies or examples of some of the work that we're doing at Mass Audubon on those uh, three fronts. But I thought it would be good just to kind of give you a little introduction to what in the world vernal pools are. You're gonna see some zany creatures, so hold on tight. Uh, again, these are, these are a special kind of habitat that's right in our back backyards, thus the title, Our Backyard Ecosystems. Yet many, many people are not aware that they even exist. And many people aren't aware that there are endangered species that can be found right in your backyard. So when you think about endangered species, right, you think about the polar bears and the Bengal tigers and the humpback whales and maybe the piping plovers if you live on Cape Cod. But how many of you think about 
<clears throat> uh, damselflies or spadefoot toads or fairy shrimp, which are examples of some of the secretive creatures that live in these small vernal pools, which you see pictured here. So let's just give you a little introduction, a little 101 to vernal pools to whet your appetite. So what in the world is a vernal pool? Well, it can also be called an ephemeral pool. Vernal means spring. And so vernal pools hold water in the springtime and they ultimately dry up during the course of the summer season and into the fall. At this time of year, if you were to walk out to your forested backyard, you would very unlikely see a vernal pool unless it was a very, very large perennial type vernal pool. These are small in size. They're generally in a forest, although there are exceptions. They're isolated, meaning, you know, it's rare that you actually um, find them associated with rivers and parts of larger perennial water bodies. They have this seasonal hydrology, which I mentioned, but the most important aspect is they are really rich in biota, lots of creatures in them, and they don't have fish. So without fish, right, you don't have a, a key predator that's in the ecosystem that can wipe out a lot of these smaller invertebrates and amphibians. It's the lack of fish that allows these special species to survive. So you can compare a vernal pool with a permanent wetland or a perennial wetland as we might call it by looking at how it functions in the energy flow. So in a permanent wetland, you've got sunlight, right? Which is captured by various plankton and, and rooted hydrophytes or aquatic plants. And then the primary consumers feed on these and then in turn are fed upon by other carnivores. So this image here represents that chain starting with the hydrophytes, the small um, plankton, followed by the species that are the bottom of the food chain, and then some of the larger primary consumers, turtles, fish, like we mentioned earlier, otters, herons, birds, and so on and so forth. So if you compare this kind of an energy flow in permanent wetlands with the energy flow in vernal pools, you see a very different type of ecosystem. So in vernal pools, these ecosystems are fueled by leaf litter and detritus provided by the surrounding forests. And then shredders, as they're known, and collectors and fungi and bacteria feed on these predators. And so what fuels the vernal pool is very different than what fuels a perennial body of water. And this is what makes it so unique and so special. In terms of the water contribution, so vernal, again, they're temporary. They hold water for portions of the year. Cape Cod has one large shared aquifer, right? We're a single source aquifer. And that just means that anywhere you go on Cape Cod, you're drawing water from the same source. Many people aren't aware of this. If you walk down to your neighboring kettle pond, what you're looking at is exposed groundwater. That's a lens of groundwater. If you dig down with an excavator in your backyard, you're eventually going to hit groundwater, and it's going to be the same groundwater that you see if you walk a mile down the road to your neighboring kettle pond. Vernal pools are a type of a kettle pond. They just hold water temporarily, so we call them kettle holes. So kettle ponds hold water year-round, kettle holes don't, and kettle holes all across the Cape are considered vernal pools. And they get their water from precipitation, obviously, and it can come from the sky directly above them, but it can come as runoff. When we had the massive storms last month and this month, right, we, we had a huge amount of runoff. All that runoff is going down into our groundwater, fueling our single source aquifer. And then vernal pools during the summer months, they dry rapidly because they're, again, they're usually in forested areas and you end up seeing this transpiration effect, which is where the plants are growing, they're producing uh, carbon dioxide, they're absorbing oxygen and they're, they're um, the other way around. Right, and then they're drawing water down. 
And so you'll see a huge drawdown of our kettle ponds and vernal pools during the summer months as transpiration takes effect. So if you have vernal pools in an open field, you're not likely to get as much of that. Okay, a little bit about just the water contributions. And again, these vernal pools and the forests around them provide leaf litter to fuel the food chains and the webs that we were talking about earlier. The, the forests around the vernal pools, they shade the vernal pool to moderate the temperature of the water, right? They contribute this transpiration effect. And then they serve as this awesome upland habitat for the amphibians that live in these vernal pools. And we're gonna talk about them a little bit. This photo, by the way, was taken at uh, on the Elizabeth Islands in March. Nashon Island is a, a beautiful intact forested island that has never undergone any kind of deforestation. And in it has these spectacularly large tupelo trees and oak trees like you see in this image and these crystal clear vernal pools. And I had a, the luxury and the privilege of getting out to visit this place about seven years ago. And I was blown away by how pristine it is. In fact, it's the only place on the Cape that has never seen deforestation for farming and for shipbuilding and wood um, and, and so on. An amazing, amazing opportunity. So another thing about these vernal pools is like I said, they exist in isolation. And a vernal pool or at least a classic vernal pool doesn't have um, a stream input or an output, it's isolated. Sometimes you can find vernal pools in floodplains. Some may be found um, attached to the groundwater as I was mentioning. Some develop into vernal pool complexes or scattering sort of pockmarked vernal pools across the landscape. And then the vernal pools vary in depth. I'll skip over this, but just so you know, here's images of different types of vernal pools. In the upper left-hand corner, this is a vernal pool that's part of an oxbow. So um, a complex of vernal pools, some of which overflow into one another and create a big complex. This image on the upper right-hand corner is a mountainside vernal pool. So vernal pools don't have to be down in the low areas. They can be perched on top of a mountain, believe it or not. On the lower left is an image of the Concord River, frozen in winter with water overflowing its banks. A lot of these little overflows can contribute to small vernal pools that will hold water for a portion of the year and then ultimately dry up. And then lower right-hand corner is a classic vernal pool in a deciduous forest in New Hampshire. So all sorts of shapes and sizes and all sorts of amazing creatures, rich biota from the smallest microscopic creatures to the shredders that we were talking about that form the foundation of the food web up to some really amazing invertebrates. And we'll just rip through a couple of different examples of these creatures that you can find in vernal pools. And then we'll talk about the significance of them. So let's get to the fun part here. We're talking now, first we we're talking about the physical characteristics. Now we'll talk about the biological characteristics of what makes these so cool a whole host of invertebrates. Again, these are the shredders. These are animals that feed on the leaf litter that falls into the vernal pools from the neighboring forest. They then become numerous in numbers and are food source for all sorts of creatures that live in the vernal pools. So very small microscopic creatures in the upper left-hand corner, scuds as we like to call them. They're basically the type of a small aquatic freshwater crustaceans, amphibians like the spring peeper on the upper right-hand corner. And then other amphibians like wood frogs. So let's talk about some of the cool invertebrates that can be found in vernal pools. This is called a fairy shrimp. I'd be curious to know how many of you have seen this or have heard of a fairy shrimp or know the significance of them. Um, the significance of them is that these are animals that live only in vernal pools and can't possibly survive in perennial water bodies that, that hold fish and, and are holding water year round. Um, their life cycle is such that they need to have a dormant period where their eggs lie dormant in the sand or in the dirt in order to germinate, so to speak, and produce these larvae that you're seeing here. Uh, fairy shrimp have an amazing adaptation that they can live as an egg on the bottom of a dried vernal pool for several years, sometimes four to five years, and remain viable. Ultimately, when the flooding rains come in the springtime with the snow melt and our spring rains, these eggs will hatch and these small creatures will emerge and float in the upper water uh, column. And the males and the females look different. The males have these long tusks that you can see in the upper right-hand corner sticking out of their head. The females have these really wild egg sacs here. The little embryos are wiggling around on the inside of these uh, small fairy shrimp and they're amazing to look at under a microscope. 
And again, these are creatures that are, we call obligate, meaning that they are requiring vernal pools to survive. They're certainly specialists, that's for sure. Other types of specialists that live in vernal pools are things like fingernail clams, a freshwater clam, dragonflies of all sorts, damselflies and dragonflies both breed in vernal pools and they lay their larvae, which spend a portion of their lives in the water. And then ultimately they metamorphose like an amphibian would metamorphose and they leave the water and become the flighted aerial creatures that we see flying around us. Dragonflies start their lives in aquatic environments as these funny looking larvae. Beetles of all sorts that you see flying around you also start their lives in vernal pools. Think of a vernal pool as a nursery for a lot of these creatures. A lot of these creatures are predaceous. They eat other, other animals. And what you're looking at here is a predaceous diving beetle larvae feeding on a tadpole. It's got its mandible on the leg of the tadpole. Tadpoles of various creatures, wood frogs, spring peepers, even larger tadpoles like green frogs and bullfrogs are food for a lot of these invertebrates. Many people wouldn't expect an amphibian to be food to an invertebrate, but they are in many cases. Strange creatures that live inside self-built huts like caddisfly larvae can be found in vernal pools too. In this image, you can see the head. I don't know if you can see my cursor as I wiggle it, but hopefully you can. There's the head of this caddisfly larvae that has, is protruding from this hut that it's built for itself as protection and camouflage from other predators like this whirligig beetle that would love to eat him. So this creature here builds these um, cases out of the surrounding detritus that's fallen from the leaves. Giant water bugs, this thing is about as big as it is on the image here on my screen. It's about two and a half to three inches in size. It's a big, scary looking creature, especially if you're an amphibian larvae. And those strange protuberances off its back are the eggs. Those eggs will hatch and become small water bugs. And this is um, the adult carrying its young around on its back. You can imagine as you look at these images, how amazingly mystical this must be for a young child. And we're gonna to get to um, some of the programming that we do to engage children in, in this amazing wonderland in our backyard. Kind of larger than life, right? So this is a midge larva, kind of a worm. This is an isopod. This is a back swimmer, loudest animal. What in the world do I mean by that? Scientists have determined that this creature, a small invertebrate native to North America called the back swimmer or a water boatman, another name for it, is actually pound for pound the loudest animal on earth. It can actually be heard with the naked ear submerged in a vernal pool. Not that many people are spending time submerged in a vernal pool with snorkels and goggles on, but if you were to do so and you were to calculate this, the sound emitted from this creature per pound, this is the large, loudest animal on earth. So there's a nature nugget for you, you can take home. I'm gonna skip by that. So those are just some examples of some of these, we call them again, these obligate invertebrates. These are creatures that absolutely rely on vernal pools for their survival. If vernal pools don't exist, these creatures don't exist either. Now we're talking about some of the amphibians that rely on these vernal pools. So the, the amphibians rely on the vernal pools because these are the places they go to breed. In the springtime when the snow melts and the rains fall, amphibians come out of the upland around the vernal pools. They, they live underground in the earth. And they'll make their way down to the vernal pools where the water is to breed. So if you walk out on an April night, go down to your local wetland, you'll hear the cacophony of spring peepers, right? Everybody has heard this. Some people don't know what they are, but everyone's heard them. And that call you're hearing is the males of the species screaming their heads off, trying to attract the females to come down and breed with them in the wetlands. And believe it or not, there's a whole choreographed, it's like a play, there's a whole choreographed, um, play that takes place here in these vernal pools during the course of the spring months. It all starts out in the early March weeks with spring peepers calling, usually followed by American toads, gray tree frogs, 
spadefoot toads, um, fowler's toads, they all come in a succession, one after the other. And they don't all come down at the same time because there's only so much room in these vernal pools for these amphibians to breed. And so they have evolved to take turns, so to speak, and they each come down at separate times. It all starts with the, uh, the spring peepers early in the spring. So that's the synchronous emergence that I'm referring to here. They all make this overland migration. You've probably heard of the big great salamander night or the big night as we call it, where amphibians will make their way down from the uplands towards their vernal pools. And in many cases, they have to cross a road to get there. And whether it's at the national seashore with spadefoot toads or whether it's uh, out in Western Mass with spotted salamanders, there are always a core of, of uh, conservationists and volunteers that are out at the roads directing traffic to make sure that these cars aren't crushing all these amazing endangered gems that are trying to get down to breed. The males precede the females, like I said, that's just because they're the ones calling. Think of it as like birds, right? The male birds will call for the females to attract their mates. It's the same situation with these amphibians. Some of the males will set up these territories. A lot of these amphibians will do that, including spotted salamanders and wood frogs. They'll set up shop in the vernal pool, they'll stake their claim, and then any female that comes into their territory, they'll, they'll try to um, breed with immediately. Females will eventually arrive after hearing the cacophony of calls and they'll start choosing which males they're gonna be breeding with depending on who's the loudest. Sort of the fitness um, debate that's going on. The females are trying to figure out who would be the fittest male to breed with and it's, it's generally speaking those that are the loudest. And then they have this, in some cases, an elaborate courtship that takes place. And then ultimately the females leave after they lay their eggs. So these vernal pools are really just hot spots during a short period of time. And then once the eggs are laid, the adults leave. And then, then it's just a race against time. All of these eggs that are laid from the various species have only a set period of time to reproduce, I'm sorry, to, to grow, to develop, and then ultimately to metamorph and exit before the vernal pools dry up. So it's truly a race against time many, many years, all the eggs in these vernal pools will dry up and become fertilizer because the vernal pools dry up before they've reached a late stage of development to get out as, as a metamorph creature. So here's a spotted salamander. This is one of many people's favorite vernal pool creatures because they're huge. They're almost rubbery in texture. They're very secretive. They only come out during very, very wet nights in March. They congress, as we say, they come down in large numbers, they'll congress in the vernal pools, they'll breed, and then they'll depart and go back underground, not to be seen again for another 12 months. And these are some photographs of spotted salamanders on the ground, making their way down from their upland burrows to the vernal pools to breed during these spring rainy months. One of the amazing things about these is that they have this set schedule. They have adapted to understand that the vernal pools that they're breeding in are only gonna hold water for so long. So they're gonna come out regardless of whether there's snow on the ground or not. They are set to a specific phenology, we call it, right? A very strict time scale along the calendar. And it doesn't matter if the vernal pool is wet, frozen um, with snow or whether it's completely thawed. They know that if they don't come down during a key period of time in March, they're gonna miss the boat. Here's an example of the Congress I was talking about with swarms of males and females congressing. You can see them with flashlights if you walk down to a vernal pool at nighttime. It's a fun exercise to do with little kids because these spots will glow. You can sort of get a sense from this middle um, salamander here. So the females and the males will congress. The males will leave these little sacks of sperm. They're called spermatophores. These little white dots on this leaf here are the spermatophores. Here's a close-up of one in the upper right-hand corner. The females will then move and absorb these spermatophores with their cloaca. And then that spermatophore will fertilize their eggs. So this is a very unusual type of reproduction called external reproduction. It doesn't involve actual mating. 
And this is a very, very primitive style of reproduction that is suited to things that live in the water. And then these are the spotted salamander egg masses. So after the female absorbs the spermatophore and it's fertilized, the eggs begin to swell within the body of the female and then they get released in these masses, we call them. So what you're looking at are these gelatinous masses with hundreds of little eggs inside of them. Each of these little dots are the yolks and the early embryonic development of a, an individual salamander. So each of these blobs contains sometimes 200 or 300 individual larvae that will hatch out of there and make their way into the water. Here's an image of a newly hatched salamander. It has these external gills, another bizarre feature of these things. These external gills are what allows the animal to breathe. They're absorbing the dissolved oxygen in the cold water of these vernal pools, and that's how they breathe. And here's some examples of egg masses from wood frogs, which is another amphibian that is a specialist in vernal pools. Another obligate species, remember ob obligate meaning that they're required to use vernal pools. They won't use any other body of water like a pond. It has to be a fishless drying environment. And these egg masses are similar to the spotted salamanders, except their numbers of larvae or, or embryos within them are um, five or six fold. Each of these masses can contain upwards of say 600 individual larvae, which will become individual frogs. Uh, the frozen frog. So talk about evolutionary adaptations. Okay, so again, these are animals that live in North America. They've had to evolve to be able to tolerate cold conditions. A lot of these animals will just burrow down below the frost line to survive. But many of them live in climates where it doesn't matter if you can get down five, three, four feet, you're still going to encounter freezing conditions. So this species, the wood frog, which you can find here on Cape Cod, also happens to live in Alaska. So imagine the permafrost up there in, in northern Alaska. How in the world would a fr frog be able to dig deep enough to get away from the frost line? Well, they've evolved to not bother to do that. And they have a special chemical mechanism that involves antifreeze, a natural antifreeze called um, um, glycogen. So glycogen is a natural antifreeze in the blood of the wood frog. And when the temperatures go below a certain threshold, it triggers a reaction within the frogs to produce a huge amount of antifreeze in their blood, which allows them to basically freeze up solid like this toad is. You can see the crystals at the bottom of it freeze up solid on the exterior, but the antifreeze surrounds the important cells and tissues and organs of the frog and allows it to survive totally frozen, right? So like Ted Williams managed to do, <laughs> the wood frog has managed to evolve to do this too. What's amazing is we're learning about these special adaptations such as this cryogenesis here, and we can use this for our own personal um, human medical needs. And there's all sorts of examples whereby humans can take advantage of adaptations of wildlife to benefit us, especially in the medical industry. A lot of you might have heard of how horseshoe crabs blood is utilized to test for bacterial contamination in drugs and is used for every injectable drug by the Food and Drug Administration and was used to test for the safety of our vaccines. So it's just one example. This is how important it is that we secure and protect our wildlife, not only for the sake of wildlife and biodiversity, but for our own well-being too. So that's another fun nature nugget. I bet you didn't know that one, right? The frozen frog. Okay, so spring, spring peepers. This is the species that is the loudest of the vernal pool obligate species. And <clears throat> this is one that you'll hear from long distances. It's mostly, um, it's, it's the most well-known of all the vernal pool creatures. And they get their name, uh, spring peeper, because their call is extraordinarily high. It's a shrieking peep that travels miles and miles in the night air. And you can see the vocal sacs all protruded on the males. 
Again, these are the smallest of North American frogs. It's about the size of the tip of your finger, about the size of the tip of your thumb. So you can hear them, but it's very unusual to see them. So you've gotten a little bit of an insight of some of the amphibians and some of the invertebrates. But why in the world, you know, would you want to protect these vernal pools above and beyond just the biodiversity? Well, you know, they're hugely valuable habitats we're learning. We didn't know this many years ago, but we do now know that they're extraordinarily valuable. And we are also learning now that they're a fantastic educational tool. And this is something that Mass Audubon takes advantage of. We do a lot of educational work. We like it to be hands-on, nature-based education. And vernal pools, we've learned, can be one of the most accessible and most dynamic habitats with which to teach about adaptations, about biodiversity, um, and about ecology, among many other things, as you'll learn in a minute. Um, and they're also a great opportunity to engage in this local citizen science and local government. Again, getting back to my point that there are so many endangered species right in our backyards that we should be concerned about and acting on behalf of. Not to say we shouldn't take care of the megavertebrates that we're all familiar with, but we should also be aware that there are species that need our help, that rely on us. These are specialists, such as these creatures we're talking about now. Without our help, without our protection, these species will not make it. So if you are interested in doing vernal pool conservation, you can do so by certifying vernal pools in your neighborhood. So there's no one out there in the government that goes around protecting vernal pools. Even though they're on the Wetland Protection Act and these are valuable uh, rare habitats, there's no method whereby our government, our Fish and Wildlife Department, uh, catalogs and protects these. That job is on us as citizens or folks that are members or are involved in our local conservation commissions. So your local conservation commission in Chatham, their job is to protect wetlands, including vernal pools. And on their website, you can find a way to this observation form where you can uh, go out to your vernal pool, record the species, submit this application and basically um, protect your vernal pool in perpetuity from development, from draining, from filling, uh, or from taking of the species within them. I won't get into a lot of this, but I would urge you to check, check this out, take a look at the citizen science certification process for protecting vernal pools in your backyard. Because the vernal pool is not protected until it's certified. And this is a, um, a specific feature to Massachusetts government. Most other states don't have a certification process and therefore these small valuable vernal pools don't have a way to be protected. And here in Massachusetts, we're very progressive in our conservation. We've had to be because Massachusetts is now the seventh most populated or densely populated state, densely populated state. And uh, state government has learned that if we don't act on behalf of creatures like bees, right, they won't make it. So just to drive this point home, across the lower 48, less than half of the original wetlands still remain today. And that's because they've fallen through the crack, the regulatory cracks, they're, they're not protected. They're too small, vernal pools are, most people thought, to be of any value. Well, it turns out they're not. So this is an image of a river. This is sort of the classic image of a farmland this river was flowing through a forested landscape in the 1700s. Colonists came and cleared the land for forest and created um, basically a waste zone whereby you've got what used to be a diverse habitat that's now uh, devoid of any life. And this is what promulgated the Wetland Protection Act in the 1970s. It was a realization that without protection to our fresh water bodies and salt water bodies, um, we'll lose them. And yeah, we've lost a lot of ground for sure in Massachusetts. And again, Massachusetts is very progressive in conservation. You know, if you go back to the 1700s, right? All of our towns were in balance with nature. And in the 1800s, land clearing and deforestation, sheep farming in particular, 
took hold and we ended up draining and filling most of our small vernal pools in order to um, in order to give us what we need, right? In the late 1800s to the 1950s, we did see a return to the forest. Farmers left, our economy shifted on the Cape from that of a farming to more of a seasonal um, economy. And today we have many more forests on Cape Cod than we did in say 1910. They've succeeded, the forest have. Ecological succession has happened. So it's not uncommon to look at old aerial maps of Cape Cod from the 1930s. And you can see where these vernal pools resided before they were drained or ditched or filled. And this is just an example. This is a farm. And here you go, you've got an outline where clearly there used to be a depression in the landscape and where a wetland would have resided and the farmers needed to utilize all the acreage they could for farming and they drained it, or perhaps they filled it in this case. But can this type of situation be restored? The answer is yes. This is the great news. We have um, a new emerging paradigm in conservation biology. It's called ecological engineering, which is the design of sustainable ecosystems that integrate human society with its natural environment for the benefit of both. And this is an image of a wetland being restored at Long Pat, at the uh, Schumann Holly Sanctuary in East Falmouth. It's one of Mass Audubon's sanctuaries on the Cape. And you're looking at a team of ecologists, conservation biologists, wetland managers, led by Tom Biebinghauser, a wetlands restoration specialist here, with an excavator on a wildlife sanctuary, creating and restoring vernal pools in places where they used to be before they were filled and ditched and drained. So it's very exciting now that we actually have the technology um, to, to do restoration and to restore wetlands. So we've gotten to the point, you know, we've gotten enough informed research whereby we feel we can successfully create wetlands for a variety of endangered species that use them. And we can design the wetlands specifically to meet the needs of these creatures. We have that technology. And this active intervention is gaining a lot of momentum in conservation biology and all across the country. And it's being applied, including here on the Cape, and I'll give you an example of this in a minute. So we're creating wetlands or, we're, or we are restoring them. And we're often meeting the strict specifications of the animals that we intend to protect. And we're developing a track record of doing so successfully. And that's restoring and creating wetlands to support um, rare species and to promote biodiversity and to engage people. What we're finding in conservation biology is it doesn't matter how much protection you do of the species, if you're not engaging people and disseminating the information to the public, you're only going to get so far. So this ecological engineering concept is taking root and it's extremely important. So here's an example of the difference between restoration and creation. So if you're restoring a wetland, you're going to where it was before. So these drained wetlands for farming, right? We can go back and restore them to their former functioning self. This picture on the left is a, deg a degraded wetland at Long Pasture. It was filled and drained for farming. And we now have the technology to be able to restore it to its former self. Creation is a totally different thing. Creation is where you're creating a vernal pool in a place where it wasn't before. And you may be doing that for a specific species. You may be doing it for mitigation purposes, right? So mitigation basically is required by um, regulators is a way to make up for development or some sort of a take or impact on endangered species. So two different things, restoration, creation, but they can both have the same results. And that is that they are able to protect rare species and, and res restore habitat to its former functioning self. Um, and there are researchers now that are spending their careers learning about just how to restore and create vernal pools in a way that not only looks natural, but functions natural. One example is Betsy Colburn 
from the Harvard Forest. She's an ecologist and a former Mass Audubon scientist. She's also a top Vernal Pool ecologist. And she's co-authored a, a, a number of papers about Vernal Pool creation and restoration in which she's advising practitioners in response to the number of poorly built vernal pools out there. You can't just throw a pool together and say, oh, that's gonna be a productive natural functioning pool. It takes a lot of skill and effort and know-how. And this is what we're learning to do. You need to consider all the complex uh, ecologies. You need to get the hydro period just right. And that takes a lot of math <laughs> and design to get these vernal pools to have the right hydro period the right amount of water held at a certain time. And then of course, you only wanna consider creating vernal pools when other options are exhausted. So it's almost like a last resort. So I'm gonna give you an example of a case study at a Schumann Holly Wildlife Sanctuary in East Falmouth, whereby we created a bunch of vernal pools for an endangered species called the spadefoot toad, which is a state listed species in Massachusetts. It's threatened and its fate is in our hands. Its numbers have declined dramatically because of development over the years. They've lost their small vernal pools. This is a photograph of a bunch of wetland practitioners laying the, literally the foundation or the, uh, the liner underground, which will soon become a vernal pool. And I just mentioned getting the hydro period just right is really important. So what type of wetland is preferable? Surface, groundwater, or perhaps maybe a liner? It all depends on where you are and what you're trying to protect, what species you're targeting. There's different techniques. And we've used the surface water technique, we've used the groundwater technique, and we've used the liner technique. This is a series of slides that shows you the creation of a vernal pool using a liner technique. This was in the upper left-hand corner, an open pitch pine forest without any vernal pool. We brought an excavator in to do the job quickly and efficiently with very little impact. I know that seems like a kind of a oxymoron, but it's actually using a, an excavator is by far and away the best way to create a wetland in terms of impact. And you can see the depression being created in the lower left-hand corner, taking special measurements to make sure that we get this uh, vernal pool balanced in the, in the ground and not uh, unleveled. And then several steps of laying the liner down and then covering the liner so that it's completely submerged below the ground. And ultimately, I'll show you some images of what that wetland that we just built there looks like today. But to show you that this restored and created vernal pool technique works, after one year, we had creatures colonize the vernal pool, such as a spadefoot toad. We had a whole host of invertebrates like those I showed you at the beginning of this presentation, 12 of them after one year. We had five different amphibians using these created wetlands and they were confirmed to be breeding there, not just coming down and checking it out, but reproducing. We had all sorts of birds that we were able to uh, document using the vernal pool. It's not just about the amphibians and the invertebrates, but many creatures use uh, the vernal pools. We had all sorts of deer activity down in the vernal pools, and we had actually our first occurrence of a fissure, which was pretty kind of pretty, pretty interesting. So here's a vernal pool that was just created. There's a liner buried underneath that depression. We've got some natural objects laid in there for hiding places, kind of as an inviting way for the creatures to utilize it. After four days, this vernal pool already holds water. We didn't have to fill it up with a hose, it just rained and our liner held. It was very satisfying to know that there wasn't a hole in the liner. After three months, the same vernal pool started to be colonized with all sorts of aquatic vegetation, none of which, by the way, was planted. This was all coming on its own. It's truly a build it and they will come sort of situation. First winter, iced over, still holding water. One year old, the same wetland. This is a summer photo that was starting to dry up as it should. You can see it looks and functions uh, as it should. It's very, very rewarding to be able to do this. So we talk about intervening, right? So a lot of people say, aren't you just kind of playing God? You know, you're, you're coming in, you're playing God, you're trying to dictate what, what, um, what species you're going to have and what species you're not going to have. 
But I would argue that we've been playing God for a long time and in a very negative way to the environment. And we now have the responsibility, it's incumbent upon ourselves to act on behalf of rare species in order to preserve them. And then by engaging our community in this work, you make conservation tangible. It's not just the distant polar bears that are melting and oh, I got to turn my light off so I don't kill another one, right? <laughs> it's about actually getting out there and understanding what's in your backyard and acting local. You know, the cliche, think global, act local really is true. And I can't stress that enough for our, our next generation of conservation biologists like the student here at Sturgis West. So this is the last phase, I'll whip through this because I know it's already uh, 545. But I did want to give you a, another case study. This is the Spadefoot Toad Restoration Project that we launched 11 years ago at a Schumann Holly. The goal was to restore the Spadefoot to our Schumann Holly Sanctuary. It used to be there. We knew it used to be there, but it's no longer there. And the reason it's not there is because the vernal pools it used were filled for farming. We have many partners, including Zoo New England. We have the um, Center for, for a Wetland and Stream Restoration. We have the USDA, the NRCS uh, department, and then the US Fish and Wildlife Service that are partners in the project, helping us with all sorts of technical and financial advice. So the spadefoot toad is a very secretive creature, kind of like the spotted salamanders. It lives in only a few places in the state. But as you can see, the Cape is one of its strongholds out of the National Seashore in Barnstable, a few places in Falmouth, and then out on the islands as well. But it is just a, a relic of what it used to be in terms of its, um, its population in the state. And this is their classic habitat. This is an image taken on Sandy Neck Barrier Beach, right outside my window here at Long Pasture, where I work in, in uh, Kamaquin. This is a natural cranberry bog in the middle of a barrier beach dune system. And the spadefoot toads use this vernal pool as the place to breed. It's because it's super shallow, has no fish, and therefore is ideal for the spadefoots to call their little niche. And it's not your typical toad. This creature is very unusual. It has vertical pupils. In fact, the way you can tell a spadefoot from an American toad or a fowler's toad that you might see hopping around in your yard is to look in its eyes, kiss it if you have to, gently, and then look to see if it has vertical pupils. And if it has vertical pupils, it's a spadefoot. If it doesn't, it's something else. This is the only species around that has vertical pupils. It got its name because it has this little cartilage knob on its rear leg that it uses to dig because like the sp a spotted salamander and wood frogs, it lives underground about 90% of its life. And this is about the size of it right here. This is a classic habitat on Sandy Neck Barrier Beach. These are two adult spadefoot toads. Yeah, they kind of change their color depending on their mood and whether they're moist or whether they're dry or so on, their age and many things dictate their color, but they have very big bulgy protruding eyes. They don't have a lot of the warts that you would find in an American or Fowler's toad. They're very unusual and they have their own genus. It's called Scaphiopus. And these are the tadpoles that we head start. So we go to Sandy Neck Barrier Beach. We collect these spadefoot toads from their known habitat. We raise these tadpoles in captivity. We often involve, whenever possible, schools in this process, so they get to take part in this conservation project. Once these tadpoles metamorphose into little toadlets, yep, that's what they're called, toadlets, we release them at our Ashumant Holly Sanctuary into the wetlands that we built there. And again, the wetlands that we build at Ashumant are designed specifically for the spadefoot. There's nothing more rewarding, you can imagine, than raising a toad from an egg involving students and other partners in the process, seeing the metamorphose, and then releasing them back into the wild until the point where they actually breed. And I can announce after 11 years that this year, for the first time, we have confirmed breeding of these toads that we released as tiny little toadlets starting back in 2011. It's been 10 years. The population has grown. We've, we've actually released 40,000 spadefoots at Ashumet over a 10 year period. These toads have grown and reached sexual maturity. And then they do this. They ultimately will breed. This is sort of a, a, a frenzy of male and female spadefoot toads copulating in these positions we call amplexus. So the male will grab the females. This male, he's grabbing onto the female and inducing her 
to lay eggs, at which point he will fertilize them as they come out of her body. So uh, it's really rewarding. We've actually got confirmed breeding in the Schumann. We know that the toads that we've released have been able to um, reach maturity. We know that the habitat that they're in is um, effective for them. It meets their needs. And the next step is to see if this confirmed breeding that we saw this year continues for multiple years, because our ultimate goal is to show that the Ashumit population is a sustainable one and that these animals will now be sustainable on their own and won't require us to add more head starters to the population. So it's very, very exciting. We got so excited about this that we thought we would engage students at local schools. So to date, we have built uh, nine vernal pools at eight different schools on Cape Cod, including Monomoy Middle School in your town in Chatham back in 2016. We've built vernal pools at Sandwich High School, Barnesville High School, Lawrence School in Falmouth, Falmouth High School, Cape Cod Academy, Falmouth Academy, um, and Barnesville High School. And we create these wetlands at school so that the students again have a chance to participate in local conservation so that their learning has an experiential component to it. And these vernal pools at schools can become what we call living labs for long-term study. So the teachers inherit these vernal pools, they take their students out every year and they can actually watch these vernal pools colonize. They can watch them grow and they can watch the species establish. And this can be a long-term project that can be documented for years to come. The students that took part in creating these vernal pools, the schools can come back to these schools and see um, that their efforts actually paid off. So it's a very rewarding project. We call it our living lab project. So it really does sort of make their curriculum come alive. And these are photos of students at the Lawrence School. It's a middle school in Falmouth building a wetland right on their campus, right at the school. Um, they took part in all the steps of creating it. It wasn't just a contractor coming out and doing it for them. They got to do it and experience it. The upper pictures actually are photos at the Monomoy School in Chatham, the middle school. Actually, all four of those photos are from Monomoy. <laughs> so obviously the kids love these things. If you give them a puddle, right, they're gonna go into it. And um, so there's really nothing better for an elementary grade student than playing in the vernal pools. And then even high school students have opportunities to learn and study these vernal pools on their campuses. All sorts of citizen science projects that they can do to stay engaged with. So this whole project, the Spadefoot Toad project has many facets, including this vernal pool creation, the head starting and the release of the Spadefoots, and then this living lab school program. And we really feel strongly that this project can be regarded as a human success as well. So, right, what if, what if we learn information that will increase the likelihood of success for future projects, right? How do you quantify the educational and the stewardship benefits derived from this project? These are questions that are a little more esoteric that aren't necessarily direct. These are the intangible benefits of involving the community in conservation work. This is our last slide here, but this is something I really feel strongly about and that Mass Audubon really predicates a lot of its work on, which is that increasingly these days, uh, conservation is less about the animals than getting the best out of human beings living alongside them, right? So we'll all be better off if more people decide to become better stewards of the other species struggling to live in their neighborhoods. And it doesn't matter whether it's a piping plover or a humpback whale or a spadefoot toad. They're all important and they're worthy of our, our help. So there we go. There's a spadefoot toad saying goodbye. And you may have some questions about this unusual <laughs> subject. And I hope it, it gave you a little bit of uh, insight, maybe a little inspiration to get to know uh, places in your own backyard a little bit better. And, and I'm always happy to to um, respond and talk to you about opportunities to protect vernal pools in your neighborhood or to get involved in the Living Lab Project if you have a special connection to um, schools in your community. 
So thanks, John, very much. I know I went a little over. No worries. Thank you, Ian. So I have one question so far and is, are the created vernal pool linings biodegradable and what are they made of? Oh yeah, that's a great question. They, they are not biodegradable, but they are fish safe. Fish safe, meaning that they've been tested to not be toxic. These are uh, liners that have been used for many, many wetland restoration applications. Uh, landfills, modern landfills will use these as well. They're designed to capture the water to prevent it from percolating into the, into the ground, but they don't give off any toxins. And it's proof because we've been now using these now for 11 years, hmm. and we've got um, spadefoot toads that have successfully reproduced in them. And they're manufactured by a company uh, in the Midwest that uh, specializes in doing these liners. Interesting. Uh, my question is <laughs> kind of about, okay, we think of like stagnant water, like, oh, that's gonna be a breeding ground for mosquitoes. But right. is, is, is a vernal pool a breeding ground for mosquitoes? So that's the question we always get, um, especially when we propose doing these at schools. Right, you can understand they wouldn't want to have cesspools <laughs> of mosquito larvae. And the fact is that a productive, fully functioning wetland does not have a lot of mosquitoes because they are easy targets for all of these predators, these other invertebrates that I showed you earlier, uh, to eat. So the kinds of mosquitoes that are most dangerous that spread West Nile um, and that are a nuisance are ones that are living in overturned buckets, um, um, tires that are left, trash, hollow logs, small ruts in the road, mm -hmm. pools, things like that, that don't have the biodiversity of creatures living within them. If you have a rich biodiverse wetland, such as these, you don't have mosquitoes. They're just easy targets for all the creatures they get destroyed. Not to say you don't have any, of course, but is evidenced by the vernal pools we've been creating at the schools, we're not having issues. I haven't heard a single complaint about mosquitoes due to the vernal pools we've created at the schools that, we, that we've built them at. Interesting. Okay. I, Cause I feel like that's like Good a question. misnomer, like a kind of. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yep. Yep. Again, not to say there are no mosquitoes in these pools, but they're yeah. not going to be a nuisance. They're not going to contribute above and beyond what's already there in any real significant way. So I have two more questions and they, I think they're. Sure really in, like one goes off the other in, in a way. So um, Elizabeth Donnelly is asking, so the vernal pool next to our property is infested and covered with invasive vines. Does yeah. Mass Audubon offer any help? Right, that's a great question. So when we create wetlands, um, we find that we are in some cases taking invasive species and burying them under the soil to help eradicate them. So if you're building a wetland in a location or restoring a wetland in a location that has invasive species, you might be able to eradicate them. In your case, you're talking about a natural wetland, right? That has invasive species growing into it. And the advice would be, if, as soon as you discover or detect any of these invasive, you wanna get rid of them quick. Because once they take hold, they're really hard to get rid of. Case in point is Phragmites, right? It's all across, our shoreline on Cape Cod because it's had a chance to, to really anchor and the rhizomes have gone ballistic and it's too late to do anything about it. So I, I would um, get in there and yank them as soon as you see them, for sure. If you've got an infestation that's beyond the point of being able to easily yank, then you need to reach out to a licensed herbicide applicator. Mass Audubon won't do this for private individuals. We'll do it for um, municipalities and other nonprofit organization wetlands, but there are licensed applicators that, that can um, eradicate these invasives for you, but get them quick. Mm. Yeah. Another question is, um, how would you describe the dynamics between conservation vernal pools and the real estate development on Cape Cod? The dynamics between them. Yeah, so like I was saying before, Massachusetts is really progressive and has instituted these vernal pool protections. Most other states don't have regulations to protect small ephemeral bodies of water like this and, and the ecosystems that live in them. And so, you know, Massachusetts is far ahead, but you know, you ask a conservationist like me and it's, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And so an example would be that local conservation commissions protect the vernal pools, but they don't protect 
much upland beyond them. They protect about 100 feet. It's what we call the buffer, the jurisdictional buffer zone. So you can't you know, go in and put in a path or build a house within 100 foot of a vernal pool that's been certified. But you can within 101 feet. Hmm. So what we often see is that at that 101 foot marker, there's a lot of these terrestrial amphibians that are living there and you're destroying their upland habitat. Mm -hmm. So you protect the vernal pool, but you're destroying the upland habitat. It's not doing any good. Mm -hmm. So there's still a lot of work to do to understand the use of these vernal pools in the ecosystem and we can do better, but it's all relative, right? And again, you know, half of the vernal pools in the lower 48 have been destroyed. <laughs> Um, and, you know, places like Massachusetts are doing a great job of really instituting protections through our conservation commissions. And it's at the local level. It's your conservation commission that's responsible for protecting vernal pools, nobody else. And our, thank you. Our last question is, do salamanders have the same antifreeze system also as those frogs? Yes, yeah, some do. It's an amazing adaptation for a lot of these amphibians. Um, here on the Cape, you know, it's never an issue because these animals can burrow below the frost level. And hey, when was the last time we had frost that was more than five <laughs> inches deep on the Cape? I can't even remember. So um, they do. Yep. And, and the spring peeper does as well. The wood frog, uh, gray tree frog, and uh, many other amphibians have this antifreeze adaptation. And lots of other creatures do too. It's not just the amphibians. And what was the name of the, the chemical that you called the... the Glycogen. It's uh, glycogen. yeah. It's a uh, it's a natural antifreeze hmm. that exists in the blood of these animals. Well, kind of cool. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Ian. This was really um, insightful, and I think really makes yeah. you. I want to go try to find a vernal pool now. Yeah, it's great to do it at this time. You know, we usually do these programs in the spring when the vernal pools are active to kind of get people's juices flowing and inspire them to get out there. But uh, you know. It's, uh, it's great to get the message out at any time of the year. So thanks for being uh, willing to, to hear me out on a beautiful <laughs> September evening and uh, to delve into something that's uh, a little different. Thank you. And I hope you come by Long Pasture Wildlife Sanctuary and explore our habitats here or come out to the Wellfleet Bay Sanctuary. They're both amazingly beautiful places and uh, you know gems, best kept secrets. Awesome, thank you All so right. much. You're very welcome. Thanks again, everybody.